<laughs> thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. To be with you, to be with you on heaven and on earth. That's why we're here, to be with the Lord. Some people think church is all about just being with each other and friends and family and and it is that too but it's mainly about being with the Lord and we bring him here with us and he is here among us he surrounds us he flows deep from within us and he wants to reveal himself in greater ways in our lives. I've been uh, doing some preaching from the Old Testament, and today I'm, I'm in Genesis 18. I'll be reading various verses from the chapter 18. I encourage you to to read this, uh, read the whole um, story about Abraham and Sarah. It's such a foundational word for us about God and his will and his ways and uh, his promises and his faithfulness. And we read here in the, in the beginning of this chapter, the Lord appears to Abraham, it says, near the great trees of Mamre, while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. And Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I have found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought, and then you may wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat so that you can be refreshed and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant. Very well, they answered. Do as you say. The Lord said, I will surely return to you about a t this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah had, were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And as the story goes on, again, I'm, I'm reading from various verses in, in this chapter 18, and starting in verse 16, it says, When the men got up to leave, they looked down toward Sodom, and Adam walked, Abraham walked along with them to see them on their way. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him so that he may direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring out Bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great, and their sin is so grievous, that I go down to see if what 
they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. The men turned away and went toward Sodom, but Abraham remained standing before the Lord. And then Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away the righteous with the wicked? What if there are 50 righteous people in the city? Will you really sweep away and not spare the place for the sake of 50 righteous people in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to kill the righteous with the wicked, treating the righteous and the wicked alike. Far be it from you. Will not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord said, If I find 50 righteous people in the city of Sodom, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham spoke up again. Now that I have been so bold as to speak to the Lord, though I am nothing but dust and ashes, What if the number of the righteous is five less fifty? Then he said, May the Lord not be angry, but let me speak once more. What if there are only, he continues to negotiate with God down to ten people. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he continues to negotiate and say, if there are only... Ten people who are righteous in the city would you not spare? And God said he would. We see again how God comes down and walks among us and communicates to us in crisis situations, in times of need, and is willing to listen to the prayers of those who he has chosen. You know, one of the first things that God did after he created humans, you read this in the beginning of Genesis, and, and he created Adam. It says that he came down and he walked and he communicated. He had fellowship with his creation, with Adam. And you see him doing this in a very unusual way in this story in Genesis because it it talks about the Lord appearing to Abraham and then it says there are three men that come to his tent. And if you look carefully at the text, you realize that two of those men were angels that went to Sodom and Gomorrah after they left Abraham in his tent. But one of those men was the Lord himself who stayed and communicated and and spoke to Abram face to face. It's an amazing scripture that God would care so much, even for a wicked city, even for people who were breaking all his laws, who were immoral, who were filled with violence and wickedness, And yet, he didn't keep it a secret from Abraham because he trusted Abraham. He he knew that he had called him. He knew that he was the one who would bring forth the kingdom of God through the Messiah, his seed. Jesus is the seed that blesses all the nations. And Abraham is the beginning of that lineage Now we know that Abraham shows this great hospitality towards these three strangers as it says in Hebrews 13, 2. Do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, by thereby you might entertain angels unaware. These angels and the Lord himself appeared to him as men and he treated them with hospitality He refreshed them. He made food for them. He let them wash their feet. He let them rest in the heat of the day. And they spoke to him, the Lord spoke to him, a message. A message about his own life first. He spoke to him about the promise that he had given Abraham. You see, Abraham had received a promise from the Lord that 
that his seed would be a blessing to all nations, that his seed would become a great nation. In fact, at one point, God says, as the sands of the sea and the stars of the heavens, so shall be your descendants. The problem was that Abraham and Sarah were old. They were past the time of childbirth. But that did not stop God. Nothing is impossible for God. So he was waiting on the promises of God. Abraham was, and God came to him and said, in a year, Sarah shall have a baby. Of course, Sarah's faith was weak. She laughed. She didn't understand what it meant. And we know that Abraham struggled in this area too because he had thought that maybe the child that he had with Hagar, the servant of Sarah, Ishmael, would be his heir, would be the promised one. But God made it clear, no, it would not be Ishmael. Abraham tried to fulfill the promises of God in his own strength, and he could not. He could not bring about this miracle that only God could do. God had to reveal himself in his own power, in his own strength, in his own glory. And he brought forth a son. And we know as you read further in, uh, in Genesis, it, his name was Isaac, which means laughter. Sarah, who laughed out of skepticism, would laugh out of joy as she conceived and gave birth to a son. Her son was a miracle child, the one who would and be the promised line that would lead to the Messiah himself. So as we read these stories, as I've said before, as we, we go back into the, the Holy Scriptures and we, we think about what God has done in times past, we, we reala- need to realize that God does the same thing today. We need to trust him. We need to believe we should not rationalize these scriptures and become skeptical. God wants us to believe in his word and to trust it. He wants us to understand that he wants to communicate with us like he did Abraham. He wants us to communicate with him through prayer. We see that this is a central part of the message that the whole scriptures testify that prayer is dialogue with God. It's seeking God and listening to God. It's a two-way communication. God is not distant. He is not removed. He is close. He wants to be involved in our lives. And I want to focus this morning on the fact that He even allows us to pray for others. Pray for others in situations that are beyond our understanding, beyond anything that we can possibly do. To intercede, to stand in the gap, as some people have called it. Not just for friends and family and community and people we care about the most, but also for the lost. Also for people who are in terrible sin and rebellion against God. People who are headed for judgment. Who are living contrary to God's wills and his ways. And you see, God gave Abraham that opportunity. He revealed a secret. They were not there just to tell Abraham about the coming of Isaac, his son. They were not there just to talk about his personal fulfillment of the promise. They were there also to go to Sodom and Gomorrah to see if the cry that was coming up to heaven was really as bad as they had heard. You see, God 
sees things in heaven. He knows things. And, and yet he does not just stay there. He doesn't stay removed. He comes down. He sends his angels down to be involved. He hears the cry of the oppressed, people who are suffering. You see, when we think of Sodom and Gomorrah, we think of just the wicked, the immoral, who ruled the city. But there was a cry. There was a lament. There were people who were deeply suffering because of the wickedness. They cried out to God. He heard their cry. And he was going to do something about it. God is aware of all the evil around us. He's aware of things that are going on in the world even now. He hears the cry of those who are suffering and are oppressed in Iraq, in Syria, in other places in the world. He knows what is going on, where there is violence, where there is crime, where there is immorality, where there is injustice. He cares about these things. And he allows Abraham to be a part of the process. He allows us to be co-laborers with him, to be part of the process. He wants us to get involved. He wants us to care. He wants us to pray and intercede. And Abraham perseveres in prayer. He doesn't just ask the Lord once. And why should he care about Sodom? Of course, Lot and his family is in Sodom. That's part of the reason he cared. And I'm sure that Abraham had heard all the horror stories about how life was in that wicked city. But he did care. He said, Lord, if there is only 50 righteous, will you destroy the whole city or the cities? And judge the wicked the same as the righteous? Will you not spare them? Will the judge of all the earth not do what is right and good and just and true? Of course, God will. Abraham knew how to pray, <laughs> he knew how to appeal to God's. Justice, his righteousness, his love. He loves his people. He loves the righteous. The ones who are called that, that believe in him, that seek his will. The believers. And he considers that when he is going to judge a region or a city. He considers the righteous. But he wants us to stand in the gap for the wicked. He wants us to pray and to appeal to him, to negotiate. You can negotiate with God. Did you know that? You can negotiate. You can bargain. You can appeal to him. And that's what Abraham does. And it's remarkable. He, he goes all the way down to 10. <laughs> I don't think he could have gone any farther because the wickedness was so great. But he's able to be a part of that process and it, it leaves us an example of what intercession is. Even if there were 10, God would have spared the city. And we know that God did not spare the city, the cities. But he involved Abraham in the process. He involves us in the process. When we see terrible spiritual darkness around us, in immorality, in crime, in violence, in sexual immorality like there was in Sodom, when we see these things, we need to turn to the Lord and to pray. We need to seek the Lord that he will be merciful and kind and forgiving. That he will spare our nations and our communities. 
that he will not give us what we deserve, that he will listen and hearken to our prayers. A lot of people think God doesn't judge like he did as written in Genesis and other places where he destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah from fire, from on heaven. This was not a natural disaster, folk. It wasn't a hurricane. It wasn't an earthquake. This was a supernatural judgment from God himself. There's a lot of teaching and ideas today that somehow God has softened his, uh, his touch. He's, a, he's kind of a kinder, gentler <laughs> God. You know, well, God's judgment is out of his love anyways. God judges because he really cares. And he wants to bring correction and he wants to deal with the terrible consequences of sin. He wants to churn people back to believing in him. We know through the scriptures, through how God dealt with Israel, that he, when they were unfaithful, when they churned to idolatry and sin and immorality and injustice and they oppressed each other, when there was violence in the land, he judged them. He brought other nations into the land to judge them. He sold them into captivity. Nations that were more powerful than they were. Not because he didn't care for them, not because he didn't love them. He had already told them in his law that this would happen. If you do these things, if you pursue this path, this is what's going to happen. These curses will come upon you. But if you obey me and love me and follow my ways, you will be blessed, not cursed. All that was predicted in the word of God, in the law. He made it clear to them. There were certain things they were not to do. And there were other things that they were to do, like keeping the Sabbath, like putting him first like loving him with all their heart, mind, soul, and body, and loving their neighbor as themselves. And when sin abound and and people were in rebellion and going their own way, there was judgment. There was consequences. There was things that happened. We see it all the time around us, yet sometimes we're so blind to its reality. We become desensitized to the evil that is around us and and no longer looks that bad. Or we try to change the rules. We try to say what God said is sin is no longer sin anymore. We try to adjust the law so it's more friendly, it's more socially acceptable. It loses its power when you do that. The law is to convict us of our sin. It's to show us what is the right way and what is the wrong way. It's to tell us what is true and what is error. It's to show us the difference between darkness and light, between godliness and and wickedness. We need the law. It helps guide us along the way, but we need also the cross of Jesus Christ. We would not have any hope without Christ and his death and resurrection. But you see, it was at the cross that God judged sin. He didn't just say, okay, I'm sorry, I'm just going to forgive you all and there's no price to be paid, there's nothing. It's all going to be just happy, wonderful time for us from now on. He made sure that the full penalty of the law and the transgressions of the law or the iniquity or the sin of the rebellion against the law was paid through Christ's death on the cross. He died for our sins and he rose again. 
So we have hope. We have hope even more than Abraham had hope to stand before the Lord and to intercede because we don't stand in our own righteousness. We stand in the righteousness we have in Christ Jesus. We stand through the power of the blood of Christ. We're able to intercede in a way that is even beyond what Abraham understood. Because the Messiah, the one who will be a blessing to all nations, has come and he has revealed himself to us and we are in him. So we can intercede even as he intercedes. So I want to read from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And this is from the Passion Translation about prayer. Most of all, I am writing to encourage you to pray with gratitude to God. Pray for all men with all forms of prayer and requests as you intercede with intense passion. Pray for every political leader and representative so that we would be able to live tranquil, undisturbed lives, free from persecution as we worship the awe-inspiring God with a pure heart. It is pleasing to our Savior, God, to pray for them. He longs for everyone to embrace his life and return to full knowledge of the truth. For God is one. And there is one mediator between God and the sons of men, the true man, Jesus, the anointed one. He gave himself as a ransom payment for everyone. Therefore, I encourage the men to pray on every occasion with hands lifted to God, in worship with clean hearts, free from the frustration and strife. Pray for all people. Pray for all men. Pray for those who are in leadership. This is the type of intercession that Abraham was doing. Pray for the lost, the wicked. Pray that God's judgment would be changed so that they can be spared. Pray that we might be spared in the midst of his judgment. As we re- hear about so many terrible things happening, even in this country and around the world, things that are shocking, the violence, the crime, the terrorism, we live in a time of tremendous uncertainty where the price and the consequences of sin is so obvious but hidden by many. And the danger is that we become indifferent, desensitized, asleep, thinking somehow that these terrible things will never reach our door. We know from 9-11 and from the many years dealing with terrorism from the issues of dealing with the drug wars and all these situations in our society that terrible things have and do happen even in America. And we are not immune from these things. We need God's help his protection. We need his favor, his grace, his mercy. We need to stand in the gap and pray, to wake up to the reality that we could lose everything that we hold dear very easily in the times that we live in. But there is always hope because we serve the God of hope, the God who intervenes, the God who changes things, who transforms, that can bring people to repentance, who can bring revival, restoration, 
and healing where there has been so much rebellion. But he needs his people who are called by his name not only to deal with their own sin but to pray, to stand in the gap, to negotiate with them, to bargain with him, to be involved in what is happening around him. We are called as God's people to be a house of prayer for all nations. We are called to intercede, to be priests and kings unto the Lord. We are called to stand in the gap. And I think we're in serious times right now. And there are opportunities in the church to come together to pray. There are opportunities to pray with other churches coming up with the 10 days of prayer. There are opportunities Saturday mornings to come here to pray. Friday afternoon, you can get together in your homes, husband and wife, family, friends. You can pray. You can seek the Lord. You can, when you hear the news, which is so intimidating and overwhelming at times, Pray. Take what you hear and take action. Don't be passive. Don't be defeatist. Don't wait for some way that we're going to suddenly escape all this stuff. We need to see revival. We need to see awakening in the United States. We need to see reformation in our government. We need to see, see people turn back to God. Yes. To have reverence and awe in faith in God and his word. Not to dismantle it like it has been in our culture. Not to criticize it. But allow it actually, we're losing even our freedom of religion, our freedom of speech. Because it is politically incorrect to speak the truth about Jesus and about the word and about, about sin and, and judgment, all these things. It's, it's politically incorrect in our, our society. And there are places where people are being silenced in schools and in the military, in, in public places. There, there are people being silenced because they're speaking the truth in love. They are being silenced and arrested and find and told what they ha can and cannot say, even in the pulpit. And we need to pray and be bold in the Lord. To be bold in the Lord because we will have persecution. But see, Timothy, when, when Paul was talking to Timothy, he said, you know, pray for your government, pray for the people, so that you may have a peaceable life, that you may live in peace, that you may not be in a place of persecution and wars and suffering and violence and crime out of control. If God is honored in a nation, the nation will be blessed and it will be exalted. There will be a mantle of peace and prosperity on that nation. But that's been broken off of this nation, folks. I don't know where you've been the last 20 years, but we've lost it. We've lost it. It's crumbling under our feet. The very foundations are shaking. But we have righteous people in this nation. We have people who... They're not righteous because they do everything right. They're not perfect. They're righteous because they have faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. He is our righteousness. They're righteous because they seek God and, and they listen. They may sin and fall short, but they know they have an advocate with the Father who forgives their sins, and they know how to turn to God. They know how to pray. And that's what's kept this nation from going into deeper darkness because there are righteous in our midst. So let us continue to pray until we see a change, until we see breakthrough.
In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. So as we continue to think about prayer, this wonderful hymn that we all...